For 23 years, he has reported the news of East Tennessee. Tonight, we look back on the life and career of Bill Williams. Welcome to A Reporter's Journey, narrated by Ken Schwal. It is late afternoon in the Channel 10 newsroom. There are few places as pressure-packed as a TV newsroom as 6 o'clock approaches. New live shots on Thursday. I don't know. Lots of last-minute decisions to be made. And as usual, Bill Williams is at the center of things. That's the way it's been here for a long time. Got questions? Problems? Mm -hmm. You go to Bill. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's going to be. What else could it be? Bill is the stabilizing force in a business that lends itself to instability. The calm in the eye of the storm. The anchor. The steady hand. The island of quiet sanity in a room full of noise. But this is where Bill Williams has spent his late afternoons and evenings for the past 23 years. Come on, girl. But now, Bill Williams has found another place to spend his days. Some of us might argue a better place. Bill's not sure, but he aims to find out. He swears it's not his passion, but ask anyone who knows him and they'll tell you that if given the chance, Bill would spend a whole lot of time on the water, looking for the big one. That's why he lives on a lake. Going fishing with Bill is a good way to learn some valuable life lessons. So Bill, yeah. what's your philosophy on fishing? <laughs> My philosophy on fishing? Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you catch them or not, it's the fishing that's important. <laughs> <laughs> of course, fishing's been important to Bill Williams for, well, a lot of years. Ever since he was a kid growing up in the west-central part of Missouri, not far from the Ozark Mountains. Bill came from a normal, church-going family. His dad was in the dairy industry and taught Bill the value of hard work. His mom was a schoolteacher and taught him the value of an education. Bill's life wasn't a whole lot different than most kids his age, and ultimately, like all of us, Bill had to decide on a career path. Did you always want to be a TV anchor man? Never thought about it. Didn't, I hadn't, didn't even have a television until I was a junior in high school. Didn't know what TV was. I had no idea that I'd ever be a TV anchor man. Well, like I said, I, there, I, there weren't such things back in 1950 when, when we got our first television set. I don't recall them ever watching local news on, on, on local television. Only had one, one channel coming out of Kansas City. There was uh, Howdy Doody, I recall that. Fr uh, Wednesday Night Fright, Fights. Brought to you by Paps Blue Ribbon. Oh, you remember that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's about all I really remember. Yeah. So what did you want to be when you grew up? I that? wanted to be a minister. I wanted to be a, a, a preacher. I decided that when I was a teenager and went off to college to, to be a preacher. Got an undergraduate degree in religion, was in seminary. They threw Hebrew at me, scared me to death. <laughs> no, that wasn't the only reason. But I decided that I, I could not. I just wasn't cut out for the pastoral ministry. Um, didn't really know what to do, but I had been in a few radio stations as a singer. Uh, worked my way through school mostly, singing with a quartet. It's the Four Statesmen. Bill sang bass. They crisscrossed the countryside, singing wherever they could. Churches, auditoriums, and radio stations. And that's where Bill got an idea. I wandered into one one day in Enid, Oklahoma, said, I'm an announcer, so that's great, we need one auditioned me that day, put me on the air that night, I was awful. Just awful. <laughs> I, I trained on the job. Uh, I, I learned how to, how to run the board and, and do all the things that, that radio people do. I really didn't get into news in that first radio station for, for a while, but I remember, and this was 43 years ago, I remember introducing Paul Harvey you know, who's still with us. Honestly, Ken, I, uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll keep this job. Uh, I'll do this until I find a real job. Then, then I'll go do that. <laughs> I guess I'm still looking. Still looking. Yeah, you'll find one. <laughs> you'll find one. 
But after 10 years in radio, Bill felt it was time to move on and move up to the wonderful world of television. I told him I wanted to be an announcer. Announcer said, we don't have any, but we have news people who do announcing. I said, well, I'm a newsman. <laughs> they said, great. <laughs> 20-year-old Arkansas woman was killed early today when she... So all of a sudden, Bill Williams was a TV newsman. And again, it was on-the-job training. But he worked hard, and he learned fast. And he soon mastered the art of communicating to the masses through the lens of a camera. And in not too long a time, Bill was working at a station in Springfield, Missouri. And he really wanted to make a good impression. So he chose a hard-hitting camel story. Here? Uh, or here? No, get behind the hump. Behind the hump. Uh, one's called uh, Kush. Kush means get down, you son of a gun, and Hup Hup means get up and go. Now, this is my second day at the station. My second day. And they said, all right, Williams, why don't you go up to the Lake of the Ozarks and cover some meeting. Uh, some, yeah, you know what, covering meetings. <laughs> it, was, it was dull and boring. Anyway, I went and covered the meeting, reported on, got the report on the meeting. We were coming back to uh, Springfield, came through a little town called Camdenton, Missouri, just south of Camdenton. I happened to glance over uh, to the right side of the car, and I saw over there in a field here in the Ozarks of Missouri a camel eating oak leaves. I said to the photographer, whose name also happened to be Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, now, I'm brand new in television news, but that looks like a television news story to me. A camel here in the Ozarks. What in the world is he doing here? So here was Bill Williams' entry into the world of investigative journalism. Now, be very careful, but see if you can take and cross your left leg over the front of the hump. Now, that's quite a job right there. Here, Clyde. Ooh, now. Now, if you can kind of hang on to the hair a little bit, see if you can cross your left leg over oh. your right leg. Now, grip with your ankles. Now, that's right. the way they ride. Now, put one hand up in the air. Now, that's the one they hit him with the stick, see? And the other hand's on the rein, so it'll take, let go of the other hand. Now, how'd you like to go galloping? Uh -oh. get but it? Bill kept his job and moved up, anchoring the news. Truck and bus operations in Greene County last year reached an all-time high with 10,800 men and women employed full-time. Wages and salaries paid to these workers totaled $86.9 million, with another $23.7 million going to the county's merchants for motors, fuel, new vehicles, tires, parts, and accessories. And forecasting the weather. Right. Now, this little cold front could make a difference in our weather if it gathers some momentum and some strength, but uh, probably not for at least a couple of days. Throughout the nation today, temperatures were quite warm, with the exception of the extreme northwestern part of the country. It was 56 degrees at Seattle, Washington at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And anchoring the, the sports. American League President Joe Cronin has fined Texas Rangers pitcher Jim Merritt an undisclosed amount for allegedly throwing spitballs in his 9 nothing shutout yesterday over the Cleveland Indians. The American League president said there was no actual evidence Merritt had thrown the spitters, but he contended that Merritt had admitted violating the rule. Bill Williams was Mr. Do-It-All. For a couple of years, I was what they call the swing man. You talk about getting good experience. On the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday, I did the news. On Monday and Tuesday, gave the sports guy, the regular sports guy, a couple of days off. I did sports, had a couple of days off, then came back on Friday, did the weather. And I, yes, I did commercials. And sure, speaking of commercials... That's the only way to was to keep cool, but now there's a whole lot better way to beat the summer heat. All you got to do is C, C, and H. <laughs> I ain't stuttering. Listen to me careful. I say C, C, and H. Now, that's C and H heating and air conditioning. And it's yep, it's Bill Williams. Who was the old guy in the rocking chair that looked a lot like you? <laughs> that was a character I developed on radio. Uh, of course, uh, I had to use makeup when I got on TV, but I could just change my voice when I was at radio. He was a lot of fun, just Grandpa. And, uh, uh, you know, I'd say, howdy, hi, good, good afternoon, this is Bill. Hey, this is Grandpa, we've got some stuff for you. You know, uh, <laughs> it was an easy voice to do, and, and uh, so Grandpa and I did uh, work, uh, played records. Bill, sure, all us cool people knows the CNH features Fire Patrol Central Air Conditioning. They got factory trained staff, they install and service, and they take real good care of you. So see CNH, tell them Grandpa sent you. The news anchor doing a commercial? 
You know, I wouldn't touch a commercial now with a 10-foot pole because it, it, it does have a lot to do with your credibility. But, but I, I don't know, back then or back there, I'm not sure which, you, you just didn't think about it. But Springfield was a great training ground, and eventually Bill became good at doing it all. But as time passed, he made a decision. He wanted to be a news anchor, period, in a bigger market. It was again time to move on. And in broadcasting, that means making a resume tape. Hi, I'm Bill Williams. I'm a television announcer newsman for KYTV in Springfield, Missouri. I've been in broadcasting for about 14 years. I have a lot of experience in many phases of the business. In a station like this, as you probably know, some of us are called on to do a variety of things, including news, weather, sports, reporting, writing, camera work, commercial announcing. And that's what I do. <laughs> you walked in, you sat down on the stool. You remember now, this was, this was a 70s kid. Remember that. <laughs> you look fine. The tie it was, it was a beautiful horrible. tie. <laughs> well, well, I was so proud of that. I really thought that, you know, that is just wonderful. Well, I mean, the lighting was, was just great. Thanks for watching. Good day. We stayed late one night, put that tape together, and I was so proud of it because the lighting was great, you know, and the dramatic entrance. <laughs> I look at it now and just have to laugh. How did you get to Knoxville? Uh, there was an ad in, uh, in broadcasting. Said they they needed uh, an anchor. It was a bigger market than where I was, and had applied. You, had, you heard, had you been to Knoxville? You know Never been it? to Knoxville. Never saw the station. Offered the job over the phone by Pete Finley, program director, back in 1977. Accepted it sight unseen. He'd seen me on 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 tape, but uh, I had never seen the station. You had no idea what you were walking into? Had no idea. Can I tell you about the first day? Tell me. First day was July 5th, 1977. Didn't know anybody. Didn't know anything about Knoxville, didn't know anything about the station. Standing around the old newsroom, trying to figure out what to do with my hands. <laughs> there was this guy sitting over the corner. Didn't know who he was. They had no idea who this guy was sitting over the corner. Somebody, didn't know who he was, came into the newsroom carrying a box saying, Hey, Hal, I've got this box I can't get into, can't open it up. Have you got a knife? Hal, sitting over in the corner, Hal says, I don't have a knife, but I've got a gun. <laughs> Pulled a pistol out, slapped it down on the table, and I said, oh, Lord, please take me home. <laughs> Al and I became very, very good friends and, and did a lot of hunting and fishing and all sorts of things together. Yeah. From a personal standpoint, Bill immediately took a liking to East Tennessee. Once he found out that the lakes here contained fish, The mountains and the lakes provided moments of tranquility. Bill was going to need all those tranquil moments to balance out the hectic pace of Knoxville television. Bill's arrival in Knoxville landed him right smack dab in the middle of a ratings war. Television is a competitive business. And in Knoxville, in the late 70s, it was hot and heavy. WBIR trailed in the ratings, but was slowly assembling a good, solid staff. It was hard work. TV was on the verge of a high-tech revolution, but not quite there. Portable equipment was big and bulky. Bill found himself building up muscles. And he was spending hours painstakingly editing film. The staff was young and energetic with that can-do attitude, for the most part. Back then, it was called News Center 10. This is News Center 10 with Bill Williams, Janet Cunningham, and Jim Klein. 
Good evening. Blue Diamond Coal Company of Knoxville has signed a contract with a newly formed union at the Justice Mine near Stearns, Kentucky, where the United Mine Workers Union has been on strike for 23 months. Still, Channel 10 lagged behind. The station even tried to portray a new glitzier image. Didn't work, still number two. Bill figured that desperate times called for desperate measures. One more question. To your knowledge, has a male reporter ever been in the Lady Vols dressing room before? Not that I know of. What do you girls think about that? <laughs> Dustin, definitely, I think it's time to go back to you. But it was hard news that kept the station inching forward. It's hard to get people to vote on critical issues during an election year. It might make somebody mad. They might not vote for you. So it's expected that most of the critical issues will be swept under the rug, at least for this session. The law department of the city hall says they're very sorry about it. They've informed police, they've gnashed their teeth, but there's really not much they can do. But it does mean the houses will be of less value when they're sold. But it was frustrating. We'll Bill and the staff knew they were putting out a good news product, but few people in East Tennessee knew about it. Bill Williams, News Center 10. The reason, down the street, the competition had a secret weapon named Margie. When I came here, we were number two. Uh, Channel 6 was number one. Margie and Sam Brown and uh, Mike Thurman were over there as the anchor team. We were number two. We were doing pretty well. Ella Brown and I were co-anchoring in 1978, and we had, we had made some inroads in November of 1978. In February of 1979, we thought, oh boy, we're on a roll now, and we're going to you know, gain in the ratings. It snowed. It snowed and snowed and snowed, and all those dials clicked over to see what Margie was saying about the snow. And the ratings came out of some of the worst ratings we ever had, and I was so discouraged. I was offered a job in another, another market. I was ready to go. I was ready to go. I was packing my bags. And the news director said, Bill, trust me. It was Bob Selwyn, who is now COO uh, of a, a large broadcasting company on several television stations. Bob Selwyn said to me, Bill, trust me. Something's going to happen. Stay with me. A month or two later, Margie Eisen came over to Channel 10. This is 1979. And with her came her viewers. Margie's move to Channel 10 breathed new life into the news operation. All the hard work and the long hours were going to pay off because now the news product the staff was so proud of was about to be discovered by tens of thousands of new viewers. May of 1979, we almost drew even. In November of 1979, we became the dominant television station, television news station in Knoxville. Thankfully, we have maintained the, that dominance over the past uh, 21 years. But Margie brought, brought the viewers over first. But uh, it shall rain again, and folks will need an umbrella. And Margie said she would give away some umbrellas, and she will. Yes, the first winner is Mrs. Jenny. And for many years, it was Bill and Margie and the ratings continued to grow, and East Tennesseans continued to discover Bill Williams. We met a great team. I think there was great chemistry. Of course, Bill can work with anyone because he's so professional. He puts people at ease, and he's a very easy person to work with and a great anchor person. There's your chance, but you have to look Things were flying along pretty well when Channel 10 brought in the new member of the team, a young radio sportscaster by the name of Bob Kessling. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, part two of our Ernie Bernie series tonight. going to talk about Bernard King and some of his trials and tribulations. Looking forward to that and the rest of the sports with Bob Kessling in just a moment. I mean, here I am suddenly a guy that's been reading scores on the radio, and now I'm sitting on the news desk next to the Walter Cronkite of Knoxville News, and uh, that made me more nervous than the fact that I'd never been on TV before because I didn't want to screw up. I didn't want to be embarrassed with Bill Williams sitting right there. But I got through the first 6 o'clock, uh, newscast, and I remember walking down the hall, uh, basically just anxious to get back to the newsroom to regroup a little bit, and Bill put his arm around me and said, you did a nice job. I mean, that, that made it, everything else after that was easy, getting Bill's uh, compliment on that first one. But that's the type of guy Bill is. I mean, Bill uh, will make sure that the people around him feel good about themselves. And that's true. Over the years, just about everyone who's come through Channel 10 has, in their heart of hearts, striven for one thing, to hear that compliment from Bill Williams. And it meant something. Bill didn't just hand out empty compliments. That's what a young intern named Gene Patterson found out. 
and I wrote this 30 second voiceover. Uh, a simple story, but I, I mean, I agonized over those 30 seconds. I wrote it and rewrote it, and, and I thought I did a pretty good job. Well, I turned it in, laid it on the stack of uh, scripts, and back in those days, remember, Bill used to produce and stack the show. He did everything, so he was going through it, and I was sort of near him, and he, he stops, and he looks at this copy, and I know it's mine, and he looks around and says, who wrote this crap? I mean, just sort of to himself. You know? And there I was, I, and I had to say something. So I said, <clears throat> that would be me. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he was a little surprised that I was standing there. And he said, well, it's not very good. Rewrite it. So I thought, OK. Well, I was, you know, I was devastated. I rewrote it and gave it back to him. He looked at it, and he made some more edit marks and gave it back to me. I think I rewrote it three or four times. And he finally wrote it for himself. <laughs> Now, it would have been easy for Patterson to become discouraged, to give up and settle for a job in government or something. But he worked hard, and ultimately, somehow, Patterson was hired as a full-time employee. He knew what he had to do. So when I eventually got a job at Channel 10, my goal was to make Bill Williams like the stuff that I did. And uh, and because he never, I mean, he never said anything about my work, <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent. He didn't say anything. But finally, one day, though, it was several months into the job, he came to me after a particular story that I did, and he said, "Gene, that was a very good story. Congratulations, that was excellent." And I, I was, of course, whoa. <laughs> Spend millions of the news operation continued to improve, as did the ratings. And Bill's stature as a journalist rose, too. With more and more people watching, more and more people learned to trust Bill Williams. And in the news business, few things are more important than trust. But it wasn't just the viewers who grew to trust Bill. The newsmakers themselves were finding out that Bill was tough, but fair. Newsmakers like Senator Howard Baker, who several years before had made a name for himself asking his own probing questions. The central question at this point is simply put, what did the president know and when did he know it? Over the years, Bill Williams and Howard Baker would meet often and seem to develop a feeling of mutual trust. I was deeply and seriously engaged in politics at the time being in the Senate from Tennessee, so I had occasion to run across him often and to talk to him frequently, and I always found talking to Bill Williams a delight, even though sometimes his questions, as with all reporters, can be sort of probing and sometimes unpleasant, but Bill was never unpleasant. He was always, uh, he was always on the mark. He always knew exactly what it was he wanted to he wanted to do, and he knew the questions to ask, and he asked them in a sensible way, and his sentences all had a verb in them, and you didn't have to guess at what he meant, and uh, I really enjoyed working with Bill. In 1982, Knoxville was turned upside down for six months as it played host to millions of people at the World's Fair. It opened with great fanfare on May 1st. Here in Knoxville, in the Tennessee foothills, in the hometown of John Duncan, the home state of my good friends Howard Baker, and Lamar Alexander, Robin Beard, and Jimmy Quillen, the world will share its knowledge, accomplishments, and hopes for tomorrow. Americans, welcome the world to Tennessee. And for the next six months, Bill and Margie and Bob did each newscast from WBIR's Telecenter on the World's Fair site. It was a busy year for everyone. I'm sure that every World's Fair has had its own special gathering place. Including a brand new reporter by the name of Edie Ellis, who had come to Knoxville from Cincinnati just to cover the World's Fair for Channel 10. Not long after the fair ended, there were some big changes. The lights have been hung, the cameras are in place, and Action 10 News is moving to a new set. Beginning next week on Channel 10, Action 10 News will have a new look, a better look. Anchorman Bill Williams will be joined by Edie Ellis. Yep, with the fair over, Edie joined Bill on the news set. And for several years, they were quite a team. I think Bill and I brought to the anchor desk a sense that we had lived lives that had been fairly full lives. And so we came with some empathy and some 
uh, genuine understanding of what a lot of people may have gone through because indeed we had lived these these full lives and we had had different experiences in our lives. He is, as, you know, just the kind of consummate news um, person, but without the um, the arrogance that some sometimes goes with that. And by that I mean that he. Um, he understands the news of the day, he understands how to gather the news of the day and how to report the news of the day. But, um, but he does it in a, in a way that is, um, that is very comfortable, I think, for both his colleagues and for his audience. Yeah. Stay with us, we'll be right back. For a guy who started his TV career on a camel, Bill Williams ultimately mastered journalism as few others have. And he's been especially fond of covering politics. Few political stories held the drama as the inauguration three days early of Lamar Alexander. Although it was partly because of the urging of Democratic leaders that Lamar Alexander agreed to be sworn into the office of governor three days early, still, it remains to be seen how effectively the new Republican governor can work with the democratically controlled General Assembly here in the state capitol. Lamar was an East Tennessee boy, and his inauguration was extra important to Channel 10 viewers. Bill provided full coverage. As Lamar Alexander reviews the units in his inaugural parade on this January 20th, wet Saturday afternoon, he's finally come to the end of his walk to victory, a walk that included that extra mile. And those who have followed him along that walk would probably say on this day that Lamar Alexander is more than just a governor. To them, at least, in his red flannel shirt, he's a folk hero. A few years later, Bill found himself in San Francisco. So the Democrats come from Tennessee to this city by the bay. They come from Martin and Memphis, from Jackson and Knoxville, from Crossville and Cookville. They come here to San Francisco hoping to find a kind of unity, a kind of togetherness that they believe will take them to victory in November. Action 10's Bill Williams is standing by live at the Democratic National Convention with State Representative Pete Drew. 1984 opened a new phase in Channel 10 political coverage. It's strange, it's mad, it's crazy, but it works. In November, a president will be elected partly because of what is done here. It's the way it's done in America. I'm Bill Williams reporting from the Democratic National Convention in San Francisco. Now back then, political conventions actually meant something. They were more than just the tightly scripted infomercials they've become. There was controversy, suspense, and moments of high drama. Choose the human race over the nuclear race. The 42-year-old preacher son pulled out the stops, and he has the ability to pull out a lot of them. For 50 minutes, he held thousands of delegates spellbound as he pleaded and pontificated, as he exalted and exhorted. For many, it was a history-making night, one to be compared to Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech. Oh, this is, this is historic. This has got to be one of the best speeches that I've seen in the last 15 years of conventions. This is, this is just historic. You can see by the crowd what's happening here. Night was a sort of victory night for Jesse Jackson. He appeared before the largest crowd yet at this Democratic National Convention in Moscone Center here in San Francisco. Many, many times his speech was stopped by applause. He brought tears. He brought cheers. He brought people to their feet. We had never covered a national convention before. Uh, we sent uh, a crew, which included Jimmy Martin, the photographer who's behind this camera right here. My wife, Wanda, my son, Mark, came up from Los Angeles to help us. That was a crew. We went out there and we worked ourselves to that. I mean, we were working 16, 18 hours a day. We did three live shots a day. And this was back when live was, you know, this was something rather unique and rather extraordinary. We were doing three live shots a day. We were doing two packages a day. We were in and out of, of, the, of the convention hall. We ran into everybody, ran into to, to Dan Rather and Tom Brokaw. And Walter Cronkite came walking by, and, and Jimmy Martin got pictures of Wanda, my wife, and, and my son Mark shaking hands with him. I'm just a wonderfully exciting time. And they said, did you enjoy it? Yes, we enjoyed it, but not at the time. <laughs> they were working so hard. But we look back on it now, and it was such an exciting and wonderful experience. I will never forget this. 
I will never forget this. We got back from the convention. I think I took a day or two off in between uh, actually the end of the convention and coming back to work. And I came back to work on a Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever, walked into the old newsroom up in the second floor of the station. And as I walked in, all the reporters were there. I don't know whether you were or not. And all the producers or whoever, and we didn't have that many at that time, but they all stood up and clapped. Uh, and you know, when you're being applauded by your colleagues, you, you just, it just doesn't get any better. Good afternoon. Cahaba One of the people applauding was Knoxville today. news Area legend, Carl Williams. I can recall the days when I used to go to the, uh, to the Republican and Democratic conventions, and I would introduce him from out on the news set, and would ask him a question that would demand that he give me some figures, percentages, and so forth. And did you know he could not only do that, but his sense of recall would kick in, and he could go back five or six other conventions before and compare those things. It's called doing your homework. Carl was one of the first people I met on that very first day that I came to the station and Carl was, as he always is, so gracious and uh, welcomed me uh, so wonderfully. I just felt at home and he or I, I don't remember which one said, since our both our last names were uh, Williams, um, he or I one said, gee, we must be brothers. And <laughs> that started the rumor that still persists that Carl Williams and I are brothers. Well, I don't know how that started, but ever since Bill's been here, we've always called each other Brother Bill and Brother Carl. Let me say this. I had four brothers, lost one of them back in 1980. And if I had wanted another one, Bill probably would have been my choice for the other fourth brother. By this time, Bill Williams had established himself as a top-notch journalist. He had earned the respect of East Tennesseans, the viewers, and his co-workers. His reporting was top-notch. He was credible. When Bill said something, you knew it was true. And it was fair, and it was balanced. At a time when the media was taking its hits among charges of bias, Bill Williams' reporting was right down the middle. And his grasp of the story impressed his peers, as did his sense of professionalism like at a U.S. Senate town meeting here in Knoxville. Now, here's your moderator, Bill Williams. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Senate town meeting. We're here at West High School in West Knoxville, and this auditorium is filled, packed with people in every seat. People are standing out in the hall. A lot of people have come, perhaps to praise, perhaps not. We're going to find out in just a few moments. I remember coming up onto airtime, all the activity that was going around and the fact that you had all these these really, you know, pretty prestigious men sitting up on the stage and you had all the activity and all this distraction and I thought, man, how in the world? I was I was nervous and I was just one of the panel members. And Bill was, you know, talking to Senator Frist and he's talking to the other senators and he was talking to the crowd and, and all this stuff was going on and finally when the light turned green or red and the cameras came up and the and the live show began Bill suddenly focused in on that camera, delivered the best introduction I think I've ever, and, and off the cuff. There was no teleprompters. I mean, it was an intelligent introduction. It was delivered flawlessly, and amidst all this chaos, I mean, that's when I, I thought to myself, you know, he is really good. That man is good. Among some but there was another side to Bill Williams, a side known only to his co-workers. Bill Williams, he's a look at some of our top news stories. Bill? Sarah Russell, the 14-year-old Bill Williams, serious journalist, strictly professional, 24 hours a day. We'll leave it to Bob Kessling to shatter the myth. One misconception about Bill is he's a straight-laced guy. Bill is actually a pretty good practical joker. We've, uh, we've had our turns of uh, pulling a few pranks. And the thing that was funny about it, that Bill and I would usually team up on these pranks, and then it would come the next day when everything hit the fan. And of course, I'd get blamed because Bill Williams would never be involved in something as childish as that, would he? He'd never do something like Not Bill Williams. And of course, Bill would just sit there at his desk and not say a word. And, and I'm, you know, but that was fine. That was just part of the deal. It, it was nice having a henchman like Bill because he could virtually do anything at this TV station and nobody would ever suspect him of doing anything. You know, you spent a lot of evenings together and sometimes there was some mischief being made. It was all his idea. Absolutely all his idea. <laughs> well, you know, evenings, it, uh, you don't, you, you get the news written, you, you don't, you have time to kill, and uh, you sit around, and you talk to somebody like Kessling, and you come up with ideas. <laughs> 
And believe it or not, Bill Williams, Mr. Deliver the News flawlessly, occasionally, and this should be an encouragement to the rest of us, Bill Williams occasionally messed up. Bill was to do the story about a um, uh, a new McDonald's, a big fancy, maybe it was the one that had the new play, play area and something. And he said, and the next time, you know, he, he was talking about McDonald's, he said, that, and the next time you want to get your boogers and fries, you can have more fun doing it. Well, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to maintain my composure because, you know, what you hope is, you can just get through it and go on to commercial. I got so hysterical, I finally just had to put my head down on the desk. But Bill yeah. was always there to bail yeah. others out of okay. trouble, or try sure. to. It had been a long day, it was recruiting day or something, and I had kind of a five o'clock shadow, and so I decided I needed to shave. And I was looking around for some shaving cream, didn't have any, and Bill happened to have a little can of uh, the gel shave cream, the stuff that you rub and it foams up. And so he handed it to me, and I said, great. So I go down to the bathroom downstairs and kind of take that gel and just kind of slap it on my face and foam it up just a little and shave and take a paper towel and wipe my face and head out to the, to the set. So I'm, I, I sit down on the set with the red lights getting ready to come on, and Bill, all of a sudden, the red light starts. Bob Kessling, who are sports, and looks over there, and I've got just bits of shaving cream all over my face. And, so, and Bill did not break out laughing. Everybody else did, but he didn't. So I started doing the sports. Well, during the sports segment, when we'd go to videotape, then Bill would proceed to take a, a, a rag and try and wipe my face. Well, of course, the more he rubbed, the more it would foam up. And so every time we'd come back, we watched the air check. Every time we'd come back, there'd be different splotches of shaving cream on my face. And then we'd go, I'd roll to the highlights of the Reds and the Braves, and then Bill would be over there trying to wipe my face off. And I think by the end of the sports cast, I think we got most of it off. It, it's really good. Bill Williams, journalist, it, it, hey, cut up. It, 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 but there is another Bill Williams. And this Bill Williams is the one people will think of long after they've forgotten the news stories. Not too long after I came here to East Tennessee and somebody told me there are folks in our area, in our community, who are hungry. And this was a new concept to me. I, had, I, I just couldn't imagine. You know, the people that, that go to bed hungry at night, this, this was uh, just beyond the realm of uh, possibility, I thought, in, in this day and time, in a, in a time when everybody should have plenty. And so I went to find out about it, and, and you know, as you know, it's very easy to find people in our area that indeed go to bed hungry, and this has been a terrible concern of mine. Hi. And what Bill saw made an impact on him and, as a result, on thousands of others. Well, just, you know, sometimes we run out of food. The scriptural prophecy that the poor you will always have with you appears to be a fact of life. It's true in generation after generation throughout the world. Nowhere is it more true than in rural Appalachia. The beauty of the mountains in rural Appalachia is breathtaking. But far too often when you look beneath that beauty, you find ugly pictures of the tragedy of human poverty. The signs of poverty are obvious in rural Appalachia, most obvious in the faces. You're struck by what you don't see in those faces. You don't see energy or excitement. You don't see hope. In rural Appalachia, there are people doing well, living in comfortable homes, but just across the valley or down the road or even across the street, you'll see this, a wretched picture of abject poverty. It's been that way for years, decades, and it doesn't change much. We first met Flossie Brown back in 1987. A coal miner's widow, life was extremely hard. What's your average supper? Beans and bread. Today, Flossie is a little better off financially. The government checks are a little larger. She can pay her electric bill now. But still, after helping her children and grandchildren who live nearby, there's very little left. Well, I eat fruit beans, taters, and all that stuff like that. 
Flossie's little house looks some better on the outside. A church group installed new siding. There's the second of two new outhouses. The first replacement was destroyed during a torrential rainstorm. A coal stove provides heat. There's no plumbing. Water comes from a spring out back that is much less than pristine. The murky water is used for everything. Washing water, drinking water, whatever. Life for Flossie Brown and others in the cycle of poverty is a constant struggle. A struggle to exist. When there's no food, there's physical hunger. There's also the hunger for hope. But there's a certain pride. An independence among these mountain people. Believing that despite the hunger and the hopelessness, the stark existence, they will survive. Well, you can always find a way. Some way, can't you? You, you, almost, you have to be there. You have to be there and see it and sense it and, and, and smell it to realize the enormity of the problem and how awful poverty is and can be. Over the years, Bill has spent a lot of time in Appalachia's pockets of poverty. Others had done stories on the poor, but Bill went a step further, a big step. He brought a talent into this market that I don't think had ever been here before. Not only was he a fantastic newsman, but Bill went above and beyond this business of entertaining, informing, and educating. And what's your name? He did a lot of things for people in southeastern Kentucky, in Virginia, East Tennessee. He fed them, he clothed them, and he did what everybody else should have been doing. I don't think any newsman ever did that before. Other stories had said, here's the problem. Bill's stories said, here's the problem. Now let's do something about it reminds us that there are still people who are hungry, there are still children who need homes and are, are, are have difficulty being adopted because they're black, because they're disabled, because they're, for a variety of reasons, that there are special needs children. Um, and he, do, he has done this consistently throughout his uh, career, I think, as a way of, 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 um, of giving something back and and also I think it goes very much to who he is genuinely as a person. Bill did everything he could to make viewers aware of the problems faced by so many right in our own backyard. Year after year Bill kept going back and soon others began to go armed with clothing, food, toys and a whole lot of love. The mission of hope was created to share the prosperity many have enjoyed with those who were left behind. Hundreds of people have become involved, and for many, it's the highlight of their year. And Bill continues to encourage folks to help in the cause. And back in the hollows of Tennessee and Kentucky, where our booming economy isn't even a whisper, they've come to know that Bill is there to help. The lives that he's touched will be immeasurable, mm. and uh, only the Lord in his time will know everyone that he's touched. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pause to say thank you for... I mean, you see a guy on TV all the time doing the news and that sort of thing, and then to see him actually come down and sit down with a, uh, with a kid in poverty, it really means a lot. It really means a lot. While the poverty of Appalachia affects all age groups, it's the youngsters who've had the biggest impact on Bill. Kids touch his heart. on this week's Monday's Child are brother and sister who want to be adopted together. Back in 1980, Bill began a series of stories that would come to identify him as a person like nothing else had. Week after week, year after year, Bill introduced us to young kids, special needs kids, in hopes of finding viewers who might be willing to meet those needs. Loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Oh, that's so good. I need to get adopted. Why? Why? Just because my mom can't take care of me because she gets sick all the time. My dad, he how can he take care of me when he already abused me? Would you like to be together forever and ever? Yeah. You would. Why? Because we, it has lots of 
Because you're brothers and sisters. I want a family that's like, gonna treat you well. Yeah. Give me love. Uh-huh. And give me sometimes what I want, sometimes not. But I'd rather not, you know, be spoiled. What you see with Bill is warmth, caring, love. He gets on the same level as the children that he's talking to. He can relate and you really feel like he cares. And because he cares, more than 600 kids have found permanent loving homes. Monday style was, was something that, again, seemed to, to fit the community. It's been tried in other communities. It's been tried in, in other television markets in Tennessee and throughout the, throughout the country. And in some places it works, and some places it doesn't. It works here. It works here. These children, these special needs children, are adopted here because there are people out there in, in our community, in our audience, who care and who respond to the needs of these children. And who could forget this young man? Stuff like that, what? I quit. W wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What'd you say there? I said I like to chew and smoke, but I quit. You like to chew and smoke, but you quit? Yeah. Well, that's a good idea to quit, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. That's yeah. the best thing I ever done. Oh, I expect so. Well, of course, when you get as old as you are, well, you kind of have to give up some of those bad habits, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell you something that happened here one day. I was walking through the newsroom, and here was Bill in one of the editing booths editing out a piece of tape that uh, had the, uh, uh, the features on there, the, some of the children on there that he wanted to feature, and his Monday's child. Well, I noticed he had his head down, and I thought, well, the guy's going to sleep. So I went over there and opened the door and put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Bill, are you all right? He said, yeah, I'm fine, Brother Carl. said, I'm just finding some things in here that I'm having a little problem dealing with. You want to stay together? But deal with them he does, and a lot of kids and a lot of families in East Tennessee in general are better off because of it. So what is it that makes Bill so special? Well, we asked several people, each of whom see Bill from a different perspective, but have all reached the same conclusion. Wanda Williams lives with Bill. When I first met Bill, on our first date, and then the day I went back to work, someone said, well, what's he like? And I said, he smiles too much. I said, this can't be real, it can't last. Well, we've been married almost 18 years now, and it's lasted. <laughs> He's real. He's, uh, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. Angelique is Bill's daughter. That's the way he is. That's the way he's always been. He doesn't do it because he feels like he needs to do it or because he wants glory or he wants that recognition. You know, he does things because he has a passion about them. That's why he does them. I mean, he doesn't have time to do half the stuff he already does. Mike is Bill's son. He would take off uh, in between the, the news breaks and see all football games and go see school events and he was always there as all the time that he had to put in to work you know he still was there for for both of us channel 10 news director margie nichols he's not just you know mr high and mighty i am the god of journalism he is you know he's fun he's wise he's a good journalist i mean there are a lot of parts to bill that that make it fun to work with him Channel 10 General Manager, Jeff Lee. People ask me, um, are, are you Bill Williams' boss? And I, and I always say, well, on paper I am, but, but, but not really. Uh, Bill doesn't, doesn't need a boss. Uh, uh, he, Bill works for the people of East Tennessee. Uh, he knows what's right for, the, for, the, for East Tennessee, and uh, he knows what's right for WBIR. So am I his boss? Yeah, but I've never told him anything to do. Bill's co-anchor, Robin Wilhoit. And he's someone who I respect. I respect his opinion, and I do go to him in personal, when I have a personal situation. And, and it means a lot to me what he has to say, and it weighs heavily um, in, in sometimes my decisions. So, yeah, he, he is so much more than just a guy I sit next to at 6 o'clock. He's, he's a good friend, and, and I'll cherish that friendship forever. And the man who'll fill the anchor chair next says he's learned some valuable lessons just from watching Bill. He says you got to get it right, not first. Get it right. Uh, don't sensationalize. Tell people the truth without spicing it up. 
to the point where it's not the real story anymore. Uh, if, you, if you watch a guy doing that, when everyone else is telling you to do the opposite, and here's this guy doing it, and he's reached above the height that is supposed to be reached. He's, he's so far above any popularity scale that anybody else is going to be able to conjure up. It, it's a great lesson to learn. I mean, this guy does it the right way. It's not the way that everyone in school and the people at some of the other TV stations that have worked at tell you how to do it. But apparently, this is the right way to do it. It's Bill's way. Good evening, I'm Bill Williams. And I'm and the people Bill who've Bill watched Bill, Bill, Bill on television night after night, well, he's made an impact on them, too. I think he's a fine man. It makes me think about my kids and uh, how fortunate they are and for me to spend that time with them. The uh, community service and the efforts that he's made to not only be an important professional part of our community, but also the personal interest that he's taken and done in our community is, is very much appreciated and will always be remembered. Appreciate all he's done for the Fountain City area that he's showed up at the park on a lot of occasions and spoke to people and I really appreciate him. I think that that's really nice that he's trying to help children find homes that, that want homes. I, I wish that more people would be concerned with, you know, trying to help the children that, that want to have a family. I think the thing that comes across and, and um, always stop and listen is uh, how much you care. When Bill says it, you, you can take it to the bank. These are good. Bill has kept up a hectic pace for a lot of years, and while he'll continue to do Monday's child segments, telethons, Mission of Hope, and many other community projects, he's now actually going to have some time to himself. So what are you going to do with all your spare time? Well, uh, <laughs> um, there are a lot of roads I haven't traveled, a lot of fish I haven't caught. And I intend to do both those things, uh, because we live here on the lake, and uh, uh, I love to fish and be able to spend some more time there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, real, I'm not real serious about it. I just kind of like to throw a, a bobber or, or perhaps a, a plastic worm in the lake and see what happens. But uh, it's very relaxing. I love to do it. Have a grandchild, Riley, who is a joy. Have another grandchild on the way, a little girl. Looking forward to getting acquainted with her once she gets here in January. I um, love to play the piano. I used to play the violin. I intend to relearn that. And while there's little doubt that East Tennessee is lucky to have Bill, it should come as no surprise that Bill sees things just a little differently. That when we on television have presented a need to the people in our market, in, in East Tennessee and Southeast Kentucky and wherever, when we have said, here, these folks are hurting, won't you help? They have responded so beautifully, so magnificently. Unlike any place else I've ever been. I mean, there are good people everywhere. But, but the response to the needs of, of human beings in this community is, is so beautiful. And, and it just has constantly amazed me, still does, still does. Yeah, I got involved, I, I guess because I, I, I fit with the community and the, and the community accepted me so wonderfully. Yeah, I am so fortunate.
Thank you.